Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is a unique beast, combining the pure freedom of its predecessor, Breath of the Wild, with the gameplay and progression elements that have become iconic to the Legend of Zelda formula. By its nature as a game very much focused on adventure, your exploration is rewarded handsomely, especially in ways relating to the game's new mechanics, which will be explored more later. Those aside, many caves have something worth digging for or blowing up, many sky islands will have unique items to find, and nearly every enemy outpost has one or more chests, plus a ton of walking loot dispensers called Bacoblins, which Ganondorf was so kind to leave lying around for you. Unfortunately, on a slightly contrary point, the game can be a bit empty and slow depending on your playstyle. The game seems designed around its new mechanics very well, which on principle is a good thing, but the forest may have been lost for the trees just a bit. Many of the new mechanics allow for greater freedom and speed of movement, but I fear that because of that, a greater emphasis was placed on simply having a very wide open environment to traverse rather than a populated one, something which we'll talk about more in the next section. Fortunately, to expand on my very first point, the game does end up giving the player a lot to look forward to. Once the player finds the first dungeon, it's very apparent that there will be more of them, and the core gameplay loop for the critical path comes into play. Adventure your way into an unexplored corner of the world where some sort of bizarre phenomenon is happening, partner up with an NPC turned ally to solve the problem by conquering the labyrinthine dungeons culminating in a boss fight that utilizes the unique mechanics of that ally, all the while collecting tools, ingredients, and armor that generally keep pace with the game's difficulty scaling and ultimately comes to a head with... well... look for yourself. And it doesn't turn off during the final boss fight anymore. Ain't it beautiful? The world of Tears of the Kingdom is enormous, and much larger than it appears at a glance. The already huge Great Sky Island soon gives way to the land beneath in a way that, anecdotally, gave me flashbacks to when the world of Skyward Sword opened up. Players familiar with Breath of the Wild will find Hyrule to be familiar in layout, although different in both theme and circumstance, and arguably more importantly, once a player has decided to explore the chasms that have rent their way up to the surface, they'll discover an entire second map that is very nearly the size of the entire overworld. In terms of traversal, be it in the chasms or on Hyrule proper, where the player needs to go in the world is almost always made to be intuitive. Aside from a very good map system, the world is also designed in such a way that the most important visual landmarks, meaning the places that would also naturally draw the player's eye, are also where the player needs to go in order to progress the story. Even if a given area's dungeon is hidden or underground, there is almost always something apparent in the sky above where you need to go. Even in the chasms, where the vast abyss is cloaked in a nigh impermeable darkness, there are only two things that can almost always be found. Pose, which return in Tears of the Kingdom as these small, ghostly wisps, and light roots, towering plants that act as the waypoint towers underground and likewise are the only things that can actively cut through the darkness when discovered. And just as important to the world building, if not more so, are that parts of the world will change in accordance with the progression of the player in ways that make it very clear that the player's actions have had an impact on said world. The four most obvious examples are those that correlate directly to the elemental dungeons. The immense sandstorm that covers much of the Gerudo Desert, blocking your vision and breaking your map, will dissipate after the Lightning Temple. The toxic sludge pouring from the Sky Islands above the Zora's Domain leaves behind pristine waterfalls after the Water Temple, the corrupted rock roasts that have been plaguing the mines and mouths of the Gorons release them from their captivity after the Fire Temple, and the eternal winter hurricane that has turned Rito Village into a frozen wasteland reveals clear skies after the Wind Temple. With just these alone, progressing through the main path of the game has the player change the world in ways that affect traversal, gameplay mechanics, and NPC behavior, but those are just the major examples. Even on the most minor of scales, Link's presence is still felt, such as when he first arrives at Lookout Landing and goes to Hyrule Castle, and upon his return, all the soldiers that were posted up along Hyrule Castle looking for him will pack up all of their tents and equipment and move back to the Lookout. Although I did previously mention that the game seems to have some issues with world population in the game design segment, and here's where we have time to address that. 
With regard to exploring the world, if you prefer to run or to use a horse over the new traversal methods and mechanics that Tears affords you, getting around the world will take forever, and in that meantime, you'll see fairly little along the way. On top of that, with the only real exceptions being changes to major NPCs and side characters and the creation of some new outposts, very little seems to have changed, improved, or repopulated since Hyrule was liberated from Calamity Ganon years ago. You may encounter a stray NPC here or there out in the world, but you really won't find many other characters outside of significant settlements, and the same is true of enemies. There are outposts and caves, and once in a while you'll encounter a stray bokoblin or maybe one of the open world mini bosses if you're lucky, but ultimately there's nothing you'll actually be obligated to engage with unless you're starving for loot or liberating one of the couple of siege towers that you need. Suffice it to say, despite this game's world taking place a handful of years after the end of Breath of the Wild, the world certainly seemed to do most of its growing during the opening cutscene. One thing that is important to note about Tears of the Kingdom is that it is, much like many of Nintendo's games to this day, a Nintendo console exclusive. It was designed for the hardware that it's running on, and only designed for that hardware, meaning that there are far fewer excuses for issues with performance or optimization when the game is running. With that being said, many of the game's issues are fairly minor to the point of being nitpicks, and the most constant of these are pieces of the player's equipment clipping into geometry. With the advent of fused weapons, something that we'll talk more about in the mechanics section, weapons can be much longer than ever before, and consequently, we'll constantly be clipping into either the ground or whatever Link is riding on. However, by far the most significant issues are with the frame rate. Either the game's frame rate will chug like Link after he runs out of stamina, or entirely stutter to a standstill for a moment in the worst of cases. The frame rate most often slows when making constructs, or otherwise when there are a lot of moving objects on the screen at once. As such, since player-made constructs are a fundamental part of the game now, frame rate drops are going to be a very common occurrence, and will continue to be until new efficiencies are patched in. The frame holds and stutters, on the other hand, are much less frequent, although more significant, and they almost always occur in the same circumstance, entering chasms. While skydiving in, it's possible for the game to momentarily freeze when it loads in everything underground. Everything which, ironically, the player mostly cannot see, and won't be able to see until a substantial amount of time has been spent lighting up the abyss throughout playing the game. Hey there. This is usually the part where I make some sort of value judgment quip to convince you that you're more invested in the video than you statistically probably actually are, but not today. I'm not doing that, because today, we're almost at a thousand subscribers. Help me break that threshold so I can stop dating my videos by putting subscriber counts in them, and of course, who are spoilers from this point forward. Tears of the Kingdom is the direct sequel to Breath of the Wild, which takes place a handful of years in the future after that game. The Calamity is gone, and Zelda, along with Pura, Robbie, and an entire research team, delve into the secrets of the ruins hidden around Hyrule, and especially under Hyrule Castle. Given that the malice of Calamity Ganon seemed to come up from beneath the castle grounds, it only seems appropriate that Link and Zelda need to find out what's going on down there. Shortly thereafter, they discover the decaying corpse of Ganondorf, the ancient demon king and former king of the Gerudo, who, well, should just be a corpse. After Zelda takes hold of a secret stone, the main story MacGuffin for Tears of the Kingdom, Ganondorf fully reanimates, destroying the Master Sword and one of Link's arms in the process, before Link and Zelda get separated. Interestingly, it's in doing this that Legend of Zelda pulls a Metroid, providing some justifiable reason for why a full-power Breath of the Wild Link with a Master Sword is going to have to start with the standard three hearts and nothing but a pair of shorts to his name. The rest of the game retains that Metroid-esque personal motivation of regaining your lost equipment and strength, with the added motivation of solving the mystery of why Zelda's somehow been seen all over Hyrule by the time that you get back, despite also being nowhere to be found. And, of course, defeating Ganondorf in a way that doesn't allow his corpse to come back. On the journey to those ends, and amidst some time-traveling shenanigans, we meet several familiar faces from the previous game in their new roles. Riju is going to be a powerful warrior, as well as the chief of the Gerudo, and has taken time to practice her ability to summon lightning. Yonobo has founded his own mining company, and has a large amount of sway with the Gorons, if not a majority of the say in what happens inside of Death Mountain. Tulin has grown to be just like his idol, the champion Rivali, becoming as skilled with a bow as he is arrogant with his beak. 
and Sidon is slated to be married to Yona, a Zora princess from another domain, all while protecting Zora's domain in his father's absence. Also, since Zora lived to be over a thousand years old, the events of Breath of the Wild basically happened last week to Sidon, and he still considers Link to be his best and closest friend, despite not having seen him in years. On top of all of that, Paya is now the new chief of the Sheikah, having inherited the title from Impa, and Pura is a waifu now, having perfected her aging rune and locking herself in her 20s. Which, considering that she is Impa's older sister, kind of feels really cruel that she's keeping that to herself. But of course, I can't end the narrative section without talking about something that definitely isn't whatever you thought I was about to say, because we're about to talk about an entirely different game. Spoilers for the ending of a game from 2011, but in Skyward Sword, we learn of the true origins of Link, Zelda, and Ganondorf, and why they all keep coming back in every game. Demise, the true Demon King, cursed the reincarnations of both the goddess Hylia, who incarnates in the form of Zelda, and Hylia's chosen hero, who incarnates in the form of Link, to be eternally cursed and pursued by an incarnation of Demise's hatred in the form of Ganondorf. In this curse, Demise declares that it will cycle in perpetuity until his hatred finally casts the world into blood-soaked darkness. Tears of the Kingdom has plenty of obvious parallels to Skyward Sword, not the least of which being all of the Sky Islands and the flying around bits, but none are more important than the Master Sword and Ganondorf himself, wherein we get a greater understanding of the power of the Master Sword and even can hear the spirit of Fee from Skyward Sword coming from within it, and Ganondorf, who, using a secret stone that he stole, an artifact which awakens the latent potential of anyone wielding it, draws on his demonic heritage as demise, becoming the true reincarnation of the Demon King that he was always meant to be. <laughs> Many of the mechanics in this game carry over directly from Breath of the Wild. Link's ability to climb on most surfaces, except in the rain, the use of the paraglider, Link's native ability to slow down time with his reaction speed when using a bow in midair or dodging, collectible armors with different stats and unique effects, and weapon degradation all make their return. Essentially, everything except for the Sheikah Slate abilities return, and those function as the foundation for what was newly implemented. The Ultra Hand is Link's new primary ability, giving him the power to lift and move most objects, and then bind them together. Unlike in Breath of the Wild, where Magnesis, Cryona, Stasis, and... Bomb? Okay, saying it out loud makes me realize that one of those things really doesn't belong, and weirdly it's the most normal one for a Zelda game. Unlike those abilities, which all did very different things, Tears of the Kingdom really only has three unique powers, as three of the five new powers all directly relate to Ultra Hand. Auto Build is the last one that players are going to receive, but also the simplest to explain. It records any constructs that the player has made using their Ultra Hand, and allows them to recreate them at any time. This is done either by using resources in the environment nearby, or by converting raw materials into parts. This serves to enable the player's creativity, as otherwise certain combinations of building resources would be so rare to find that consistently building things like bikes or aircraft would be almost pointlessly impractical, while also serving to make the building process far more efficient and quick. Fusion takes the portion of Ultra Hand that allows the player to bond things together, and refines it down to its own ability. This power, despite being the simplest of the three, as it is literally just putting two things together, changes the entire item and ingredient economy of the entire game, and thus becomes the most complicated. Every enemy part, every gemstone, almost everything in the game can now be attached to either a weapon or shield to change its properties, utilities, or stats. This power ensures that no matter how meager the stats of that stick you found, nothing is necessarily useless so long as you have the right parts and imagination. Ascension is the one movement-oriented ability in the game, and it allows Link to leap up to any surface above him within range. Doing so, provided that there is a mostly flat surface to enter and exit through, will have him plunge himself into whatever ceiling he hit and then swim through to the surface on the top. It is a very simple power, but you'll be surprised at how much use you get out of it when fighting through enemy camps or climbing mountains, not to mention all of the areas that are built with Ascension in mind, especially inside of Hyrule Castle. Recall is the last main ability, and it really feels like Nintendo looked at the Entropy Center and went, 
We'll take that. By the way, to the person that recommended I review Entropy Center, don't worry, it's coming, you're welcome, you know who you are. Recall freezes time, and it allows the player to select an object on screen that has moved in recent history and reverse its individual flow of time. And if that sounds very mind-bending, don't worry, here's a very simple example. Here's what happens when you use Recall on a piece of the ruins that fell out of the sky. And to wrap up this section that's already gone on a bit too long, we need to talk about the new combat slash lore mechanic, Gloom. Gloom is the new evil energy goop that is absolutely not malice, because it's made of depression instead of anger. You know that it's depression because where malice actively hurts you, Gloom makes you slowly kill yourself. And if that sounds dark, it's because it's mostly found in an abyss with no light. Touching Gloom for an extended period of time, or getting hit by Gloom-empowered enemies, will lock you out of your maximum hearts and prevent them from being healed. Eventually, your health will deteriorate until a single hit is your last, and the only way to undo this are either by eating food designed to heal your broken hearts, or by going outside and getting some sunlight. On a final, more serious note though, and a reaffirmation of the ongoing spoiler warning until the end of the video, the best use of the gloom mechanic happens during the final boss fight, so skip to the visual and sound design part to avoid this one gameplay related spoiler if you'd like. Gloom is used to great effect in selling Ganondorf's immense power. When Ganondorf's minions, any Gloom-empowered enemy in the game, strikes Link, his hearts will get locked according to the amount of damage taken. But when Ganondorf himself strikes, the hearts aren't merely broken, they're shattered. Where the vestiges of his power merely corrupt one's vitality, the true darkness that the Demon King wields has the power to annihilate it. Tears of the Kingdom is a game that greatly benefits from its stylized, cel-shaded nature, as it serves not only to give the game a unique visual identity apart from other titles, but also serves to cover up the limitations of the Nintendo Switch's hardware. Even still, it's a game that looks best in motion. Stopping to pay attention and scrutinize will show that textures on a lot of services and models, like say most things made out of plain stone for example, are fairly low resolution and playing around limitations with creative solutions is the real name of the game here. Tears of the Kingdom is a masterclass in cutting corners to save space, as the game takes up just over half of a base switch's hard drive by itself. One such good idea was how the chasms were handled, as having them be almost entirely blacked out no doubt saves on processing power, as the switch won't need to necessarily visually render anything that can't be seen anyway. NPCs also follow this same trend. Aside from the actual side characters, most of the random characters throughout Hyrule are actually made with a system that acts very similarly, if not exactly the same, to the Mii creator from the Wii, 3DS, and now the Switch itself. There are videos on YouTube explaining this exact topic for Breath of the Wild, and Tears of the Kingdom uses an updated version of Breath of the Wild's engine. The vast majority of everything that was great about Breath of the Wild's visual and sound design all carry over into Tears of the Kingdom. The sound effect that plays whenever a player is in a state of slowed time, the startled and frantic piano along with the black mist and red auras that accompany a blood moon. Much like its predecessor, Tears of the Kingdom makes very intentional steps toward leveraging its visual and sound designs to inform the player about changes in game state and how the world around them is changing and evolving. With Tears of the Kingdom though, I do want to point out one observation of attention to detail in sound design. Whenever a temple boss is defeated, the ancient sage of that particular temple will speak with their present day descendant, these being Riju, Tulin, Yanobo, and Sidon. Each of these sages wear a ceremonial mask, and in their spirit forms, they speak perfectly normally. However, when they go into a flashback, contextually speaking, they're having a conversation in person when they were alive, not as a spirit. So when they speak with the mask on while they are alive, they are all very clearly speaking from behind a mask in the recording booth, whereas in a spirit form, they're communicating their thoughts spiritually or mentally without actually needing to talk through a mask. The events that shaped our people's destiny during the imprisonment we are responsible for his very existence in this world, and for that we must make amends. Oh boy. Okay, so this game taught me a few lessons. Uh, one that I actually thought about making a, an essay on, and I might still, but I really am my own worst enemy when it comes to adventure games. Because I had to go back 
and played the tutorial area twice just to be sure that it wasn't designed horribly level design wise because I'm just so conditioned at this point after playing so many games to always explore off the beaten path or even go in the opposite direction of what the obvious forward way is because there's almost always something worth finding or discovering or unlocking or whatever. Most of the time I don't even register what's obvious anymore because I'm so busy looking for what's not obvious or what's hidden. So all this to say, it took me four hours to get off the stupid Great Sky Island and I didn't exactly enjoy the game very much. It felt like it had a massive learning curve compared to other Zelda games, if not just games in general. The Ultra Hand abilities could have been an entire game by themselves, and they're only half of your kits! Not to mention the fact that the game is super slow if you want to run around like you did in Breath of the Wild or use a horse or just mostly the paraglider. And you basically can't use constructs until you get the auto builder because it's just not practical. And even then, it doesn't matter if you didn't go farming for Zonite or item capsules. And on top of all of it, you have the stupidly tight parry windows because they decided to take the Dark Souls approach to combat and give every attack a huge windup, but only a handful of active frames that you actually need to dodge during to get the flurry rush. And all of this to say that this game is great. 10 out of 10 opinion score. I loved it. And I knew I was going to love it after one very specific moment. I was actually kind of despairing when I got to the Gerudo stuff because it went into a Hyrule Warriors segment when you had to defend the Gerudo town from a Gibdo attack, which on that note, the new Gibdo design, awesome, big fan. I wasn't the biggest fan of Breath of the Wild, something which I've said in community posts before, which is most of what this game was up until this point, and I am really not personally a fan of Dynasty Warriors games, and by extension, Hyrule Warriors. Making it a Legend of Zelda-themed Dynasty Warriors games didn't make it better, so I was slogging through this part. I was dragging myself through until that temple rose from the desert, and that was the moment I knew I was playing something special because it was at that moment I realized this game has a critical path, a necessary story progression, dungeons full of puzzles that end in a climactic boss fight, and heck, half of them have you fight a boss just to get in the door. I realized that what Nintendo had just done was they created quite possibly the Zelda game I'd always wanted. A Zelda game with vast, expansive freedom like they did in Breath of the Wild, but combined with everything that made me love The Legend of Zelda in the first place. And even I, someone who plays games almost exclusively out of obligation at this point, I often can't wait for games to be over because I've got a video to do, right? I've got a deadline to miss. But despite that, even I was filled with childlike glee and joy with a smile you couldn't get off my face after one of the best final bosses and endings to a game in recent memory. And that's against Metroid Prime Remastered, Dead Space Remake, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Sonic Frontiers. That's against Elden Ring, okay? Tears of the Kingdom has a lot of problems. Absolutely. And I obviously have my fair share of complaints about it. But even still, if you have a Nintendo Switch, I think you should play it. But enough about what I think. Is the game actually good?